Hello, hello, it's Big Cheds. I'm coming to you on September 8th, uh, 2022. This is going to be a replay of one of my spaces from Twitter. There's a little bit of an echo here, I know that. I'm um, kind of changing my studio around. But anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and play this conversation. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'd encourage you, if you do like this, um, you know, please check out the other ones on the playlist. Um, just go to the, you know, Ched's Trading and go to that playlist for Twitter spaces. But without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and start it out and uh, hope you folks enjoy. Thank you for listening. A replay, thank you, and just give it a few moments while I get things started here. So just hang on for a moment, please. If you're listening on replay, it's probably a few days later, and I'm posting this on uh, my YouTube channel. That's what I like to do for safekeeping. Um, I take these conversations, and by the way, these are great conversations where I get to talk to you directly. I get to hear your questions. Um, I give you kind of my open and honest answers, and I upload them to YouTube. I have a playlist there for under Ched's trading, and that way, you know, we can keep them for safekeeping. Um, if you're a new trader, these are great. You can just spend hours and hours listening to conversations of regular folks like you trying to figure it out. Um, you kind of hear from me where I'm trying to take some of this more complicated stuff um, and I'm trying to have it make a little bit more sense. I'm trying to um, parse it out and talk about it in such a way that um, it's a little bit more understandable. And um, really, that's what it's about. So I'm Big Chad's on Twitter. Uh, I am the author of Trading Wisdom, 50 Lessons Every Trader Should Know. You can find that book right now on Amazon. You can get it in four formats, Kindle hardcover, audiobook paperback, um, and you can get it for free on my YouTube channel. Check that out. Check out the webinar playlist. Check out pretty much all the playlists. Tons of great stuff. And of course, if you're serious about learning how to trade, you definitely want to take a look at Bitcoin Live. It's the best in class educational platform for crypto. I am part of a world-class team there. I'm a founding analyst, and I do a twice-a-week full market update. No matter what is going on in my life, I stop, and I do a video for Bitcoin Live. So listen, I see a bunch of um, friendly faces, folks we've had before already, stepping up, and thank you. Uh, right now, we have about 300 people and only about eight people requesting to speak. So you see that little button there in the bottom left-hand corner? That's the request to speak button. I'd love for you to hit that button and just kind of step up and tell me what you're thinking, maybe ask a question or so. And that's how we get, that's what this conversation is all about. You know, you can hear me talk all day, but it's not really, it's okay. But when I have you as part of the conversation, that's what makes it better. So please, 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 I really want to hear from you, especially if you've never joined these spaces before. So please hit that request button. I will bring you up. Um, you want to make sure Twitter has access to your microphone. And when I bring you up, if you can just wait patiently, um, you know, until I call your name, that would be great. Let me handle all the muting and unmuting. So once again, I've only got eight people and several hundred listening. Hit request. Hit that button in the bottom left. I do want to hear from you. I'm going to bring up a few folks now. And then please wait, uh, of course, as always, please wait until I call you. Hey, can you hear me? Hold on, brother. I'm going to wait till I call you folks. I'm getting some folks up here. Folks, please let me handle the muting uh, and unmuting. So first, we up we have uh, Trom. What's going on, uh, Trom? It's good to see you again. What's going on? Hey, what's up, Chad? Just wanted to say hey. thanks again for doing the uh, doing the spaces. Uh, thank to thank you. And thanks for uploading them. I know it's a lot of work and you'll have to do it. And I listen to them a lot. And they're very helpful. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you, you know, when you're entering trades, uh, do you have a pretty uniform uh, kind of sizing, you know, you go in with? I, I've been trading uh, a lot of, like, micro strategy, you know, Bitcoin-related stocks, and a lot of, like, the, you know, just uh, New York-listed names. And, uh, you know, I kind of up the ante, you know, obviously depending on uh, the confidence in the play. But I was wondering, 
you know, kind of how you go about it or if, you know, it's as simple as, you know, more confidence, you know. Well, yeah, definitely confidence. Your, your position size, your position size should be directly related to your confidence level and familiarity with like whatever the chart is. Um, and then also the liquidity, you know, like if it's some random SPAC, you probably don't want to go in as heavy as it may be in like an Apple call or a put, you know, some type of a liquid market and something that's pretty well established, something that's probably not going to get like, you know, halted down 50 percent overnight or whatever. So there's some of that as well. But really kind of the, the, the most simple answer is to look at think about just how familiar you are with the market and your confidence level. That should be your position sizing. Um, there's no real ret set rule. Um you know, some people really would not even trade more than one, one or two percent of their trading portfolio in any one play. Some people do a lot more. That's a lot of gambling. I, I recommend three percent or less. Just that's going to allow you to deal with volatility um, and kind of unpredictability. And really, I mean, even great traders, many of the best traders win less than, you know, 40 percent of their trades. Um, and they're just managing the risk and they're taking smaller losses and then letting their winners kind of, you know, take over. Uh, type of thing so i mean i guess i i guess that's how i would probably answer that question got it okay yeah thanks Chad. uh yeah you can take me down I'll, I'll keep listening i'm I'm working my way through uh trading in the zone by uh mark douglas right now and then i got your, i got your book sitting on the side ready to rock once i'm done with that thanks, oh, thanks it's on the for side the you got me on the side bro oh wow. i mean it's don't worry <laughs> I, I have you lined up man thank it's, you uh Thanks for everything, and I appreciate Thank you. the spaces. Appreciate that. Um, I had to remove someone who kept unmuting themselves. That was Cliff. Uh, I know he'll be back. Folks, when I bring you up, I'd just like you to please wait. As I said, let me handle um, Let me handle everything. And when it's your time, when it's your turn, I will bring you into the conversation. So, Crypto Boat, nice to see you again. What's going on, Crypto Boat? Hey, how you doing, boss? Good, good. What's up What's up today, man? Thanks for yeah. joining us again. Um, I have a quick question. Um. You know, like today, um, the candles were running so fast. Yeah. And when it hit the um, EMA 8, um, is it possible, like, if you reach to that point, can I go to, like, the 15 minutes time to see if it's returning or if it's rejecting over there? Yeah, I mean, Do EMA 8 a big level. That's the concept. And thanks for stepping up. Nice to see you again. Um, yeah, the same concept we talk about with time frames is when the price is at a key level, you want to go to a lower time frame. And if you look at the daily chart, um, I put out a tweet two days ago, and people were already, there was a little bounce brewing, and people were already putting their target of 23K, you know, 22.5. And I put out a tweet, and I said, daily EMA 8 must be respected. And, you know, lo and behold, it rejected there three days in a row. It's not like that's like a magic, how did I know? It's like that's where usually things will, that's the primary resistance or support after a break. Um, when it's at that level, that's when you would go to a lower time frame. When the price um, is at a key level, that's when you go to a lower time frame. So um, that's the deal, brother. And the answer is yes. So it's a great question. And the answer is yes. That's okay, the right time so, frame. So like right now, if I want to close my short, and um, because like the candles are still so tight, can I still go to the lower time frame, mark my lines, and see if it makes like a little bit like higher high on the 15 minutes and close it? I do so whatever that. you want, brother. Listen, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't uh, proactively close it. I would probably have a trailing stop loss and then let the price, you know, get to it. Um, okay. But it's up to you, brother. Either way, it's a great topic. I'm glad to have you. Um, we have Big Tonus in the room, who's a great trader and analyst and a good friend. Uh, Chonus is popping in, and we'll get you next Christmas. What's up, Chonus? Oh, is that me? Oh, okay. Uh, hey, Chad. Uh, what's going on, buddy? Uh, yeah, interesting uh, market. Uh, you know, the last caller, it brought to mind when he was talking about the whipsaw price action we saw this morning, is that you have to be aware as traders that different markets affect other markets for specific and kind of random reasons. And this morning, Jay Powell was speaking, <clears throat> the market was expecting volatility. And we consistently see Bitcoin uh, treating, imitating, like, and especially Ethereum now is lockstep in terms of the NASDAQ 100. And so you need to be aware of these volatile event uh, potentials. Which, which happen at specific times, which we know about. We knew about this speech all week. So the fact that we saw that 
flips our price action in Bitcoin is the same thing we always see when j does some announcement or when the Fed does some announcement about hiking or anything. So being aware of that potentiality, you know, can prepare you to basically understand what kind of trade um, you're entering into. You know, you're basically trying to catch the big quick move, right, and scale in, scale out quickly because you expect the whipsaw effect on both sides as the market tries to kind of, you know, screw longs and shorts at the same time. And the market always seems to do that, right? They always seem to know exactly when to do that. And it's usually right before a big move. I mean, think about the past week of price action. It was a slow grind up, right? Every day we saw the bulls step in. We were green uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then we were even green this morning, kind of, pre-market. Um, so what happened very quickly is that we saw the stairs stepping up the whole week and then the elevator shaft down this morning. And it just showed that any supports that were assumed to have been built, you know, SPY 425, 420, and of course, Bitcoin, uh, you know, holding in a 24, 23, 5 range. Um, none of that uh, shown to be uh, true. And both fell through those areas like a hot knife through butter. That sounds uh, I like a little bit of hot butter and some corn right now. Um, next up, we have uh, Christmas. It's great to have you, Christmas. What would you like to say to the group? Hey, uh, thanks for uh, putting on these spaces. Super helpful. Um, I wanted to just ask about Chillis. Um, I know you had put out a call earlier about this, um, and I followed you into that. Um, caught a really nice swing. But uh, and then I sold around you know, 25 cents. I'm wondering if it makes sense to kind of watch that um, if it has relative strength against BTC and maybe go back in. Uh, well, it's still, it definitely has relative strength. It's one of the best charts right now, probably the best altcoin chart. And it's testing the daily EMA eight. This is a spot you'd look to buy. Um, you know, it's an uptrend testing right the EMA right eight. It's held it pretty much since, you know, since the middle of August, it lost it, you know, for two days and regained it so it's you know if you're looking to play something on the long side this is probably one of the better bets awesome okay but and then when dangerous because you're fighting you're fighting definitely some strong you know bearish momentum but just specifically on this chart that's one of the best altcoin charts absolutely and when, when you do look to evaluate relative strength is there a rule of thumb that you use or is it simply action against btc I don't look at BTC pairs. Um, what I do is I look at the BTC USD chart and I know the chart. I have it like in my mind. Sure. Um, and then so I'll note like, okay, Bitcoin's below its daily at 20 or, or whatever. Say, you know, below the daily MA50. And then I'm scanning around and like, wow, this one is way above its daily MA50. And you can see it's got relative strength. So I kind of know what Bitcoin looks like. So when I look at everything else, I just know what's stronger and weaker. And, um, you know, over the last like two weeks, there's only there's only been a handful of, of altcoins above their daily MA200, the blue, uh, long term trend line. So I've just focused on playing those on the long side and anything under it. I've been looking to short on a bounce. So, you know, relative strength, um, is, it can be as simple as which ones are still uptrending and which ones are not, you know, these to be, you know, still above the uh, daily MA200. Awesome. All right. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for that info. And I'll sign off and keep listening. Thanks for, thanks for stepping up today. It's nice to have you. Uh, let's see. Who is next? I think it would be DJ Moons. What's going on, DJ Moons? Hey, Cheds. What's up? What's up, Big Chonus? Um, yeah, I just wanted to come up to thank you once again, my friend, because hey. these spaces have helped me. Good to to not wreck myself. And uh, I just I, I had you know been studying you for years, and I had great like you know great analysis using my horizontals like. Everything was tight. I just had a few bad habits. And after talking to you, it was like, you know, it was like the one on one interaction. It made me feel like, oh, like that interaction made me feel like, oh, God, I got to be accountable to Chad's. Like if he knew I was doing these bad habits, he would he would he would he would, <laughs> he would tell me tell me how it is. Right. So um, I yeah, love dude, that. I've been, I've been in cash. I took a little trade after we came off. I'm on ETH. So like I took a little trade when we came off um, the 2K. I waited for that to play out. And I said, OK, let's see, maybe 1700s, you know, support. So I, yeah. I was like, let me start. I'm not going to go all in like I used to. I, I've started scaling in and that, that's been super helpful with stress and stuff. And I just put my stop loss. Didn't work. 
you know, it failed there and went back down a little and then it came back up above 17. And I, I had those habits, those itchy habits of like, I got to get back in. It's going, yes. it's going to hit 2K. I could get a little scalping. I said, nope, I'm going to wait. I, I could sense there's something wrong here. And I just stayed patient. And then boom, this morning I woke up and, and that's a really good, um, what Shona said, like, which took me years to learn because in crypto, the narrative is definitely like, oh, this is alternative asset class. It's uncorrelated. <laughs> But if you yeah. start paying attention to markets, you see how correlated it is. And I knew yeah. the macro was on thin ice. And I, you know, yeah. I just kind of said, let me see what happens here when people take profits on Friday. And look, man, we're, we're way below where I cashed out at 1650. So <laughs> much, much love and respect. And I really appreciate you. And I, you know, I truly consider you a mentor, a trading mentor, and I, I don't have any other ones. So thank you for everything. Well, it's really kind of you. I'll try to um, I'll try to live up to that example. And that's, you know, in the same way you're, that you said I'm holding you accountable, I'd say you're holding me accountable because, you know, I need to think about what I'm doing and saying, know, knowing that it's um, people are looking to it. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, we got to think about Ethereum and, turn, and not just Ethereum, but momentum. And it's smart of you maybe not to jump right back in. And you can see kind of Ethereum has been in a little bit of a rising wedge or, a, you know, bear flag type of situation. And I'll just briefly talk about the Ethereum chart. Um, but look, it's right here, though, at the daily MA50, you have a long thesis. It's held here. It's bounced off the daily MA50, you know, three times in the last week. So we're at one of those, like, key pivot levels where it either bounces here or it's going much lower. Um, so, you were, you, was, you know, nice of you to kind of hold off. This is actually a level where you're kind of interested, you know, if, if you think <laughs> there's still some juice left in the tank here. Um, this is a spot that has to hold. And you see the daily MA20 is resistance now. I think Chonis had a couple thoughts on your comment earlier um, about uh, the narrative and kind of people talk about things being correlated or not. Um, what do you got for us, Jonas? Yeah, Chance, real quick about ETH. You had said that you felt it was the thing that was pulling the market up over the past few weeks and the narrative of the ETH 2.0, Web 3.0, whatever that thing is, uh, happening in this near future and the narrative behind that, right? So ETH is pulling the market up and the ETH, BTC pair looks looks pretty strong, um, but as Ted said, also that you use limited amount of coins that were able to regain their two hundred. That's a very important level. Um, you know the correlation between these markets. It's it's almost more correlated now. There was a time in 2020, 2021 where you could see Bitcoin front run S and P sometimes, or you saw S and P sometimes have a move and then Bitcoin would fall. It was very uh, so it was spaced out. Now we're seeing stuff almost lockstep because it's the same risk profile right now. And right now, it's still a risk off profile. This move we just had recently still has all the indications of that counter trend uh, potential wave four rally before the final uh, kind of, you know, bring down. And as the last call talked about, just like Friday price action, right? Like this was a pretty good week. If you were in some calls through the week, you know, if you're able to hold overnight, if you were intrinsic in the money calls that didn't have the time decay and stuff out of the money, you were able to basically scalp some nice call winning moves. Um, so it's Friday. It's the end of August. I mean, we're literally kind of technically in that last weekend of last week of summer mode. And this is it. This is the end of the low volume that we're seeing in the price action and mark my word come september 1st when the kids are all back in school and all the parents have to really now start to focus on what they want to accomplish in the fall you're going to see that volatility rise because people kind of decide <clears throat> you know do i need this money do i want to take some of the risk off that maybe i didn't have a chance to do or whatever but i don't want to lose this bounce a price action and the correlation is stunning about what happens now. So you want to see what's going to happen with Bitcoin and stuff. It's lagging bearishly to the overall markets, but you're still lockstep. Thank you, Big Chonis. By the way, folks, his name is up there in the description of the spaces. You can go ahead and give him a follow. He's not always active, but when he is, it's, it's always interesting. And I always do enjoy having him in on the conversation. Uh, next we have feeling stabby and folks hit that request, hit that button in the bottom left. I want to hear what you have to say. You make the conversation way more interesting. So please do request to speak feeling stabby. What is going on? 
So just a quick question for you, and I'll jump off and listen. But just getting into leverage trading, um, what would you say is an upper max for um, times leverage to use even on high conviction plays? Two or three X. Okay. If you're new, especially if you're new, I just wouldn't do it. But if you're going to be kind of crazy in leverage trade, try like try like two X. If you're profitable, if you're profitable two X, then move up. Like why start at okay. 50x or 25x, and by the time you realize you don't know what you're doing, you have nothing left. Right, right. right. If I put a 100x trade in and I nail the bottom, I could be, I could be, I could be rich. And that's why we're on your yacht right now, right? Um, so that's my that's my honest advice. Is really I wouldn't go more than like 2x unless you're unless uh, you know what you're doing. Like instead, people they're like, where do I start? At 50, 20? Oh, 10 seems safe. Only 10x. No. <laughs> How about like, yeah, you know, I've just no I've kept it around five starting off, and so far I'm batting a thousand on profitability. I'm just worried that that might be building my confidence a little too quickly to it jump is, up. It is because the best traders, some of the best traders, are only like win like forty percent of their trades. Okay. So you're going to remember if you're at if you're that high, you haven't even started. Then you need to get a lot of you know time under your belt. When I started playing poker, I'm a pretty good tournament player. When I started playing, I played I think over a thousand five dollar tournaments before I moved up. Like five dollar entries. This is online. And I was grinding, but I just really grinded it out at low levels. You got to build up rather than kind of starting somewhere in the middle and not really show, knowing like you know what what left and right are. So it's a great topic. Um, and thank you for stepping up. All right. I would just say one thing quick about uh, using higher leverage. I think it's okay to use a twenty five x or even a fifty x if you're doing very low money. You know, if you want to do a thousand dollar trade. By using, you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks, or I guess it would be less than 100 bucks, but um, that's fine. You just know what your expectations are. You know, there's a better chance you're going to lose that 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 500 bucks to, you know, make a four or five or six thousand dollar trade. Um, knowing that risk, you're putting out a lot more risk for a potentially much better reward, but you have to then realize what the chances are of you. Uh, being liquidated in that trade as well. And in that kind of a trade there, I mean, honestly, you can do it, but you want to have, um, I would argue, you know, much more of a tighter stop because that can go south real quick. And um, I think if you're in a lower leverage trade, I think you can definitely uh, widen out your uh, stop there because your volatility, because you're such a low leverage, is, is that much less and that can allow you basically time. You're you're buying time by entering a lower leverage trade, and that's kind of the advantage of that. We have a great guest, Fibble Schwani. He's been trading, I think, over twenty years. Fib, do you have any thoughts on leverage? Uh, up, actually, Fib? hey, what's up? Hey, Chad's. What's up, man? Hey, Tronus. Uh, I, I I'm probably not the person to talk to about this because. Uh, I lean toward not doing leverage at all. Um, I'm a spot yeah. trader and I just, um, I used to, um, and I just found that if you just kind of take it a little bit more conservatively to kind of trade another day, um, it, it all depends. I mean, it depends on the situation, but I lean toward not doing it at all. So, I mean, it's a little tougher that way. I mean, you got to have a little bit more capital to, you know, spot trade to make anything worth anything, but uh, sometimes you got to do leverage when the when the opportunity's right. It's great to have you, man. And um, if you want to jump into some of the answers, you know, just just feel free to kind of hang around. Just nice to have you, of course. Oh, thanks, man. Hey, I, I got a question for you, real quick. I, when yeah. I just popped on, you were talking about uh, a moving average on the daily that was hitting the support. Or, I missed it just when you when well, I popped ETH, on. Ethereum. We're talking about Ethereum. In you know, if you if, kind of I I you know the idea of looking for like what the most obvious level is where the most data points and for the daily chart you know ma20 uh, the middle bollinger that's been the most important level for ethereum certainly since april at least okay you know, re rejected like five times and we flipped it it was support five times and now we're back under it so it's resistant again so you know okay. you know, okay. you know what resistance is and also daily ma50 it, it's held uh, like four times in the last week for, for eth so that's kind of how i'm viewing it right now kind of short term within you know within a larger channel that's how i'm viewing it Okay, I got you. I, I didn't know which, uh, which, what you were looking at when you said it, so I just want to make sure. Thanks, man. Thank you. So tired of speaking, or tired of globalists. 
Sorry. I don't know why I'm so tired of speaking. Tired of globalists. What's up? It's nice to have you here today. Um, what would you like to say to the, what would you most like to say? Hey man, what's up? Happy Friday. Um, just sitting here with my dog. We're looking at the charts. And, uh, Good. It's a dog. It's a dog day, man. Right? Yeah, it definitely is. And he's got some good ideas here too. But but I want to get your thoughts on uh, you're looking at some relatively strong charts here. Like someone mentioned Chili's before. So I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on the importance of um, like a daily golden cross that seems to be coming. It's it's on a couple of them. What do you mean by you be a golden cross or a moving average cross? The golden cross is fifty two hundred. Yeah, right. the two hundred, right? You got on what on Chiz on CHZ? Yeah, you're you're above the two hundred, and you got the fifty coming up from below. And there's about three or four out there like this daily. Right? Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, okay, yeah. So this is actually a time when you you'd start to look a little bit more. So the thing with moving average cross is there's two key things you want to look at, and I talk about this in my book. Um, I don't have the free chapter, this chapter up yet, but I will eventually. You want to, you, a moving average cross um, needs a trend to reverse. So let's say the price drops down sideways, I'm sorry, drops down and goes sideways for a while. You know, those moving average crosses aren't really that valuable because all the moving averages have kind of flattened out and come together, right? But a moving average cross after a big move down, like a very quick moving average cross back up, that's much more valuable. So a, a moving average needs a trend to cross and reverse from. That's point one. Number two, you want to look at proximity to price. So ideally, if and when we get the um, the golden cross of 5,200, you want the price to be right there as, as it's crossing, right? If the price is already like 15, 20% higher than where that moving average cross is, hap- has ha- is happening, some of that move or a lot of it's already baked in. So you want to look at, do I have a trending market to cross and reverse from? And what is the price proximity to the moving average cross? What, what about the angles that they come at each other? Like if they're close to a 90 degree? Yeah, you want a violent angle. You want a violent cross. Yeah. Like the 50 looks like it's shooting up. That's great. CHC is like the best altcoin chart right now. It has been for a while. Yeah, there's um, a I don't call it Chili's because I get hungry if you call it Chili's. But CHC <laughs> looks like the <laughs> it's the best altcoin chart right now. Um, what, yeah. What are have you looked at QNT? Because that one is of course, really yeah. QNT is on my list. It's not as good, but it's it's good. It's not as good, but it's it's good. It's definitely that's in the top five altcoin charts. I'm kind of. What do you think? I mean, I'm stuck with that one. I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's a- testing support. It's holding and testing support. You know, in that like 98 to 105 level, it's been basing here, and you know, ever since really middle of July, you can look at that move above, kind of as a deviation, um, and hope that it, you really just want to see if it holds support here. You know, you start to get below 100, you start to lose market confidence, you start to get below that key level. So this is a very important part point on this chart, right? Just above the 200. And one more quick one. All right. What, what platform do you use when you're shorting? Because I don't, I never short. I haven't, you know, I haven't messed yeah, with I'd that. I'd say though. you have to look around a little bit. I don't, I don't really have a great advice for you on that. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks, Thank man. you. Thank have you for one. the great questions. Um, average dad crib oh jonas what do you got just real quick buddy i was thinking about chilies and about the ribs uh you know it reminds me a lot of the bear market of 2019 and how um you know there was a couple coins that during the vicious bear market were on nice uptrends you know i remember eos uh i remember bnb uh there were a couple other ones i recall that just kind of bucked that bearish trend and had a for for several months like a really nice bullish chart and things look good and then yada 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 in the end they all basically retrace most if not all of that bullish move uh, or a lot of it at least so yes this kind of one of those things where like it's summertime and there's a lot of uh liquidity still in this market we can't forget that there's still billions and billions of dollars and in, in projects that are dead and defunct but still have the kind of uh, overall capital in them and that we're seeing those pumps of play out so that's kind of what i'm seeing now but overall the counter trend moves tend to fall apart in the end yeah but do you still i mean but don't you just still i agree but don't you still just trade that chart until itself kind of breaks down or do you are you kind of saying like don't even bother or what do you think well that's the thing as you said there are these outliers you know and there's always a couple of ones that are extreme i, I remember theta like a, what earlier like a year and a half ago was on just a ripper and clearly like um, way out in front of everything else. So you, you, there's always that coin or two, no matter what. 
and it's just showing that I don't care about this bear market. I'm going to keep accelerating. And and uh, another thing too is like you know keep note of these. These can be sometimes projects. I, I use that word with quotes um, that do do have longevity over the long term. I mean, think about uh, EOS and B and B. You know, EOS was had such uh, promise, right? And it turned out to be one of the biggest dogs ever of the dinosaur coins. Uh, whereas B and B had one of the largest pumps I've ever seen. You know, after being at thirty six bucks in the bear market of twenty nineteen, I remember, and uh, seeing like, oh wow, it's so you know, it went to what eight eight hundred dollars in this last move. Um, so not all all coins are created equal, and there's sometimes there's enough of a of a story and enough of the right people behind these projects that can kind of take them up. And another thing I'll say just real quick is, you know, I, I know I know Chad's kind of mentioned he didn't necessarily like to. Uh, stare at or watch the um, not stare at the uh, the BTC pair charts and just the USD is more but there are clear signs in several coins um, of strength uh, you know from uh, Bitcoin that you can kind of see a little more clearly I think in the BTC pairing and and those are the clues that you get I feel kind of earlier on than you will sometimes in the USD chart, as well as who's trading them. That's a more clearer and truer um, determination of, of strength versus Bitcoin. That's a great explanation. Always happy to have you, Jonas. Average dad crypto, what would you like to say? It's nice to have you here today. And oh, sorry, uh, well, Fibbo, average, do you mind holding Fibbo? We'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, actually, actually I, had a, I had a little bit more on the uh, Golden Cross. Um, the uh i've done i've done back studies uh years ago and i'm sure the numbers are probably relatively the same but what i did was i did a back test on like the s p 500 uh and it wasn't really the the near term on the golden cross as a good trade it was more of a longer term hold uh because when you look at the first 30 days um on what i did it was somewhere around a minus two percent loss uh within the first 30 days but the longer the longer you go out, ninety days to you know six months to a year, uh, it works its way up to sixty or seventy percent gains over the long term. So I always tell people to um, if you're getting a golden cross, it's more of a verifier of a possible trend change uh, more than it is just to buy it right then and there because it can kind of eat you up a little bit when it first happens. Uh, but if you got other things that you're doing. Uh, um, to, that you can hold long term, it's a better long term type uh, signal. Uh, just from a back test on the S and P five hundred, I mean, it's just it's just a one go to, I guess. Doesn't it kind so of make sense intuitively as well? Because you're talking yeah. about a fifty day average crossing a two hundred day average. That's saying that the medium and long, like the medium, is confirming the long term trend. Like that's not like you know, <laughs> you know, like a weekly call option kind of, type of thing. You know, exactly, exactly. So yeah, intuitively and also back testing all kind of works together to say just because it crosses, just doesn't go out, just don't go out there and buy it just because right. it did. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, maybe look for an entry. Money. Maybe maybe look to buy in the next dip, right? Yeah, like, yeah. And and really watch it over the first, you know, two weeks to thirty days, uh, if you're doing a little bit more longer term swing type trading. Uh, and look for those support drops um within that first, you know, first month uh Thanks, for Fib. longer term stuff. So. Great to have you, Fib. Well, I just want to throw it out there. <laughs> I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Thank you, brother. Um, average dad crypto, what's, what's going on? It's your time to shine if you are there. And if you're still around, yeah, I'm, I, Hi. I'm, I'm here, Chad. Thanks uh, for having me. It's nice um, to have you today. Thank you. Yeah, you guys briefly touched on this already. I, I really wanted to kind of just bring up this ETH uh, BTC pair. Um, and I think Jonas had said, had said that, uh, you know, that chart has looked strong um the other side of that chart that i'm interested in with is really bitcoin dominance and uh I've, I've been short eth um have closed that position now we'll be looking to re-enter uh but if i look at bitcoin dom or the dominance chart you know it's it, it it's looks like it's you know hovering around 40 here again uh and this is about the fourth touch on the daily 
uh, of that area. So I, I'm curious to see what happens here. Mm-hmm. Uh, curious to see really where this market's going. I mean, is, is Bitcoin yeah. going to reestablish its dominance? Typically on these alt seasons, we're seeing uh, Bitcoin dominance, you know, 60%, 70%. We may never see that again. But yeah. Mm-hmm. But but really, that chart to me is interesting. I, I don't. Okay. I, I know it's it's. I know it's really not a chart you can trade on. Correct. Uh, it's it's really more something that I look for for confluence. So All right, that's like a great topic. Cool. This is a great topic. I'm really glad you decided to bring it up. I mean, um, you know, and I kind of think about you know Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin is the king, and Ethereum is like altcoins and what the, as a proxy for the altcoin market. And that's why, you know, I said earlier I don't look at BTC pair charts. The really the one exception is the Ethereum BTC pair chart. And actually kind of the strength in ETH versus BTC is what helped spot the top back in October, November. Um, If you can kind of review my tweets and tweets of others, you know, we talked about how that Ethereum breakout then was a cautionary sign for Bitcoin, kind of a big warning sign. So you kind of want to look at the ebb and flow of altcoin markets. Ethereum has been leading, had been leading for the last few weeks as well, which is a little bit of a warning sign that we'd had that much of an Ethereum bounce without really Bitcoin doing anything. Um, I don't personally use dominance because I don't look, spend time looking at stuff that, that I'm not trading. Um, I try to look at less rather than more. I know other people who are probably better traders than me use dominance, which is great. You happen to have two of them with us, Big Chonus and Fibble Swanee are probably better traders than me. Chonus, do you use the uh, dominance chart? Every morning. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know what to make here. of that. I was looking for a joke, but go ahead. Let, let's get a real um, answer. So, all right, there's, there's a lot of debate now about how really reliable dominance chart is it now because they, they're including or they're not including uh, stable coins. And, you know, I, I, I get it. That, that definitely can deviate from the dominance chart. So if TradingView could, could definitely do a thing and separate stables uh, and some of the uh, locked up stuff, if that makes a difference uh, in that. But... The overall idea of the dominance chart is how much of the money in the crypto space is in Bitcoin versus it's like Bitcoin and everything else. But it's all kind of the same, right? It's just that Bitcoin has its own network and these other coins have their own networks. But it's still the same basic crypto, you know, cartography, blockchain um, system. Now, the notion of the flipping where ethereum or for a while a lot of people thought even soul or uh or bnb uh could uh induce that flip um but um you know in in my opinion we're not going to see an end to this bear market um without somewhat of of a notable rise in bitcoin dominance i don't know what that means anymore i i'd like to see it at least over 50 percent uh, but I don't know if that's, you know, kind of the whole accuracy. And the last thing I want to say it basically is about we know what's going to happen next. And we know what's going to happen next because the Bitcoin history of Bitcoin has been during a expansionary uh, equities bull market, unprecedented, basically 12 to 14 years. And that's been its entire existence has been in that zone. So. We are now approaching a new paradigm where the Fed is no longer accommodating and where it is raising rates versus bringing them to near zero, which are two things that have never really uh, had that Bitcoin has never really had to exist in that environment. So that's why we're seeing the downward pressure on equities. And what we talked about earlier is the correlation between equities and Bitcoin is strong. And that downward pressure, I feel, is going to continue. I think we're going to see insane moves in September and probably more or less October until things kind of iron out. And things do tend to kind of stabilize as we get to the end of the year after some really massive volatility. As a trader, that's what I'm thinking about. You know, there's been a lot of hand sitting, in my opinion, over the past month or so about how to trade this market. It's been pretty rough. There's been wick outs and and chop and a lot of sideways price action. But I know that there'll be better opportunities for me as a trader that likes to look for that volatility. And I think it's coming. I sure hope so. That'd be wonderful. Um, Bitben, what would you like to say? Um, And folks, please consider joining the panel. Both Big Chonus and Fibble Swanee both give great content. Bitben, what's going on? Hey, Chads. Hi. Um, uh, thank you for hosting uh, the space. Uh, I, I had a question in terms of uh, DCAing, having a DCAing strategy. Uh, 
Yep. Um, when you when you're considering a, a four four year time frame, where would you enter? Um, just your take uh, buy, in terms I'd of. I buy. I buy a little bit every week. If you're talking about over four years, I just buy a little bit every week and not even think about it. But where do you start? Because uh, we've been going weekly down two hundred. Weekly two hundred. The weekly two hundred. Yeah, I, even a guy like me who was who was you know who was who was selling in the sixties, I'm looking at weekly two hundred. Like is appealing mm-hmm. if you're four years, yeah, of course, weekly two hundred. So this okay. is fine if you're if you're really thinking four years. I think buying here is completely reasonable, and you buy more and, if it goes lower. And and just to add, um, today I had the Atlanta Fed uh, president mention that uh, it's gonna take eighteen months for them to consider even pivoting. Um, I don't know what's your take on that, given like the current market so conditions. Listen, I have a couple of better guests who will respond to that. I will just say there's, you don't need to spend any time thinking about it because if it's important, you'll see the price do something. Just focus on the price. Either hold support or not. You don't need to like spend too much brain power speculating while you wait, okay? Um, so, okay. what's up? Yeah, it goes back to what I was saying about the Fed runs the show. And I do not believe the Fed is ready to to pivot there's still plenty of money in this market and rates are not high enough yet to basically counteract all the inflationary pressures that we've been seeing build over the past couple of years and the fed knows it's way behind the eight ball on this and we're heading into a very interesting time this winter where we're going to see fuel prices in europe like we've never seen before and that could have catastrophic effects so for them to have any wiggle room in their policy making, they have to keep the foot on the perpetual gas of raising rates. And come September, which is, I don't know, next week, uh, they're going to start quantitative tightening, which is basically pulling uh, assets off their balance, their balance sheets. And they've, they've told us they're going to do this. They haven't really started in any meaningful way yet. But that's going to be another, you know, mm-hmm. negative downward pressure because that's going to just add supply to what could be an oversupplied market already of uh, stock equity and bonds. So these are all things that are headwinds for the overall market. And in terms of dollar cost averaging, I mean, if you have a four year time horizon or longer, you're basically playing that for the next, you know, if there is one Bitcoin uh, bull rip. And you have to ask yourself, you know, is my money, uh, if I have that kind of a, a longer term time horizon, should it be complete allocation in Bitcoin? Should I spread some out to other coins? Remember, there's going to be higher risks. You're putting money in things other than Bitcoin for the greater chance they're no longer existing in four years. But there is the benefit of the chance that if they are existing, they have a better chance of exponential percentage growth than Bitcoin could based on past history. I love it's a lot of big words from you today. Exponential paradigm. Um, I have to ask you to spell them for me. But hey, Mohammed, it's great to have you, Mohammed Magdi. Nice to have you back. What's going on, Mohammed? Hey, Chad. Uh, thank you for having these spaces, and I, I I can never tell you how much I'm learning from these spaces, and how much uh, your masterclass videos have made a difference on my trading. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I have a question regarding Adam. So it's Cosmos Adam. So it's a, it's a really interesting chart to me. So it recently broke of a key horizontal. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And and I wanted to ask you about it. It, it, it really it recently has Let's very see. good relative strength compared to the market. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's it, it's in a state of throwback right now. So I just want. Yeah. I, I just want to ask. What's the difference? What's what? What do you consider, or when do you consider uh, having a throwback or having a lot of meat on the bone and shorting it? Well, here's the thing. It's interesting. This one's in the middle. It's got a pretty decent structure. It's throwing back right now, but it's below 200. So I'm probably not just my personal style. I'm trying not to play downtrends. So I probably look for a similar structure, something above the 200. Maybe I play try to buy TRB on a, on a um, you know, a, a throwback to the EMA eight. Or you know, CHZ or QNT. I'm playing something stronger. That's you know, that's how I would do it. So, mm-hmm. um, but I, I would say it's a very defensible plan because you're testing the highs of May. You know, you're testing the highs of July, really in August here. Yep. You know, if if you're buying here and your stop losses, I don't know, like eleven five. I think there's something wrong with that. Um, 
I could also see taking a look at it maybe if it tags the, the daily MA50. Give it kind of like a rising demand there as well. But I'm just not playing downtrends. I'm just even though it looks pretty good, it's in my tier B list. It's on the second page. It's on the B side of the album, if you know what I'm saying. So um, that's just how I, I'm, I'm that's how I approach this. Let's hope that hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much for your help. Thank, Thank you. you, folks. I'm Big Chats on Twitter. I've got a great panel of guests. Please consider following them. Um, we all we each kind of do different things. Check out my YouTube and the free version of my book, Trading Wisdom. Uh, Bay, your turn. Keddy Bay in Lurden. What's up? Thank you, Chet. Chet. I want to talk about two things a little. First off, uh, one of them is uh, what does it mean following you? Twitter, only following you on Twitter means to me. And second, I want to share a, a little experience of me. Um, after I followed you, I learned you from only your tweets. So I could have predicted the crash that started at 8 June. Then I could have predicted crash uh, last week. That was, uh, I predicted it, these crashes from that at hourly uh, charts, a single candle broke down all the EMAs and MAs. And I said to myself, oh, it's going to crash. Uh, these two crashes, I think, um, uh, we, we could... So this crashes from the same signs. But I think that crashes power are getting weaker. Do so you uh, I think it's reasonable. Let's conceptualize this. And, and it's great to hear from you. And I'm so happy you've um, th that this is the topic. So if you look at Bitcoin since November, we kind of crashed pretty strongly down with like kind of unabated or unchecked bear force until February when we started to close above the uh, daily EMA 34, you know, speaking of moving at moving averages and we went sideways for a little bit. And within that, within that channel, you had a weakened bear force, right? Until yeah. it eventually failed to break out and then continued because trends usually continue. Most of the time trends will continue, not always, but usually they'll continue. So after the failed breakout, that trend continued. And then you had unchecked bear force, uh, on Bitcoin until like July, middle of July, when we closed again above the daily EMA 34. And we've been in kind of the similar posture of more sideways of a weakened bear force, but it's still a bear force because we're still below the daily EMA 200. And we just had a major deviation in the weekly chart failing yeah. to hold the EMA 8. So um, I think whenever you're not sure, you kind of want to take a guess and go with the trend. And you're talking about single candles, candle weakness, the recent outside bars. That would be two candles, the double outside bars we just had August 14th and 15th. So if you're paying attention and you're trading with the trend and you're letting the kind of candles tell the story, I think you're doing, um, I think you're, you're doing just fine. Um, do either of you two, two gentlemen have anything to, to say about that, that excellent question from the uh, caller? Look, we're we're a hair's throw till back in the teens for Bitcoin. So you could really argue that maybe <clears throat> the dumps are weaker, but Bitcoin is still pretty pretty damn weak. Um, and you could argue the exact same thing, honestly, when Bitcoin was at thirty k and had some pretty nice bounces, you know. 30k to 35 and back to 30 and back 35 and then 30 again and then like 39 and then it just crashed from from there so i don't see that in the market i don't see uh what like a seller capitulation uh that's strong enough for me to confirm that you know a bottom is in and i don't think the bottom is in um <clears throat> i think this is too much like we haven't really talked a lot about like what happened with three arrows. You're not really hearing it in the market. What happened with Luna? These are still having major ripple. Why do we need effects? to talk about it? Why do we need to talk about it? If it's important, the price will do something. Like why do we need to talk about it? I totally reject that notion. Because the price is doing something, and what it's doing is nothing. Maybe. And because of that, there is risk and there is fear out there still. 
and it is keeping its foot on Bitcoin price action. And, and that's exactly the market I think we are still in. And I think there's a lot more capitula, capitula, capitulatory events mm. uh, that are going to happen because I think there's more still to come out about exposure to these, frankly, Ponzi's uh, that are to the tune of, of hundreds of billions of dollars. These are epic amounts of money that were just given to these these guys like here you go here's billions of dollars and yeah. you know all good well, listen, and then it's <clears throat> i think you make some really good points i think you talk about the damaged psyche of the retail market if i'm kind of understanding you correctly are you kind of alliterating to that you don't heal that over a summer recess you, you don't you don't oh okay we've we flushed out all the bad of the market we had yeah. to move to bitcoin 17.6 and Bibbo, man, you called that. You called 17.6 was like one of your levels. And still, that's held up for a couple months there, man. So that was a great call. Um, but it's, 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 this market's still wounded. And I think uh, people have got a little complacent over the past couple of weeks because the equities markets has had a relief rally, frankly, mostly driven by uh, short covering uh, because hedge funds were, were very short this market a couple weeks ago, and they had to cover. And that pushed us, pushed Apple back up and pushed Spy back up. These were big moves over the month of August and the last two weeks of July. <clears throat> and with all of that, Bitcoin still barely holding on to 20K. I mean, come on. All right. Great, uh, great commentary. Um, let's keep the conversation flowing. So happy to have the guest speakers. Um, block chain bob charles yes sir hey cheds how you doing thanks for taking my question i appreciate it thank you so um it's funny you know talk about synchronicity my question was kind of related to what uh your co-host was just talking about bottoms being in or not um i know you're a masterful technical trader but my question is a little less chart centric so i'm wondering given the current market structure and global discontent what are your thoughts on the impact of the halvening cycle of Bitcoin on current price levels. Now, the last two cycles, we got the lows in Q4 of the year after the blow off, right? So November uh, 2018, after the blow off in 2017, after the big run up, uh, lows uh, basically, and the cycle before that, it was like around the same. So it was like 550 to 600 days from the bottom to the halvening. Uh, then we start to grind our way up. So what I'm asking is, do you think, given the current marker structure and price, we'll get to the point in the next few months where we bottom, where some of that angst from retail investors kind of flushed out, people kind of start feeling good about things again, like your co-host was talking about, and then we start moving up, and then we repeat what we've seen the last two cycles. We get a raging bull market 2024, 20, 2025, or do you see some sort of other deviation where we see totally different scenarios playing out? Thanks great, very much for the question. That's a great question. I think it's a great topic. I'm sure my, my co-host may have different thoughts. Um, I think, you know, I think the biggest danger is, is thinking that, you know, what we did the last 12 years is what we're going to do the next 12 years. And if you look at what's happening now with the price, you know, if you take over the last like two or three months, we have the deepest um, kind of penetration of the weekly 200 in history. Like the chart has never been this damaged. Um, you know, the long term chart of Bitcoin has never been this threatened. OK, um, even though it still hasn't done, you know, whatever, 85 percent from its from its high, it, it actually still it looks it has never looked this bad, actually, um, because we broke below a prior all time high. We've never done that before. Um, the weekly MA200, it looks like it's turning into resistance. That's a really bad thing. Now, in the short term, that can be fixed. It, you know, by putting in like a double bottom at 17.5, 18K, maybe even a slightly lower low, 16K, you know, and kind of bouncing up with a spring. Um, I tend to think it's going to be more sideways for longer than people think. Um, and it's going to really have to frustrate people. This isn't a crypto winter. These articles I see Bloomberg and here's how to, you know, here's how to bundle up for the crypto winter. It's not crypto winter. There's still way too much enthusiasm. If you've been around for more than, you know, if you've been here before 2021, you know, like, this is not a winter. We're kind of just getting a fall chill. So um, that would be my answer on that. What about you, gentlemen? Fib or Chonis, do you guys do you want to touch on yeah, that? Yeah, I think, um, I think, I mean, does it matter? It's like talking about, like, 
who's going to win the Super Bowl in 2025? You know, um, the team well, that's going to win the, hold back. Tell the, us. the team that's going to win the Super Bowl in 2025, you know, is, is working and planning and practicing and building now. All right. Because they probably know they can't win it this year, maybe next year, but they got a good rookie quarterback second year now. And they got some, you know, young players. And my point is that <clears throat> to get, and this kind of re- reverts back to the caller earlier about having a four year plan and like a DCA plan. If your theory is that Bitcoin is a long term value asset that will grow over time, that will continue to grow over time and put in, you know, overall higher lows, even though we broke the previous high, which we've never done before until this time, that plays a factor in it. In terms of the happenings, I feel the happening going forward will get less influential in what's happened. We've been from, we're going to go from what, like uh, six blocks to three or something. I mean, it's not going to be a big change of less supply coming on the market for now and for the foreseeable happenings in the future. The big ones have already happened pretty much from uh, in the last two were, were still very meaningful in terms of how many blocks were taken off the market uh, or how many rewards were taken off the market uh, per execution of a block. And that's a big deal, but it's a lesser deal now because we're still 19, 19 million plus are we at 20 million? I mean, it's basically 20 million Bitcoin minus all the ones that are lost and stuff. Um, so the number of Bitcoins is pretty much going to stay relatively tight and relatively, uh, um, what's the word, current, uh, not very. Uh, so I think it's going to have less of an impact. But my point is that if you want to think about what Bitcoin is going to be like in 2024, um, you know, now is the time to be basically planning your strategy for that. You don't know the bottom is in. I don't know the bottom is in. It could be in or not. But it's relevant if you're thinking about Bitcoin three years from now. You want to be thinking, okay, if I'm wrong or right, at least I know I have skin in the game now. And you compound that over the next two, three years, and you're positioning yourself no matter when you bought basically be able to ride that next cycle and i said earlier you might find uh better returns in non-bitcoin uh products but you might be taking on more risks so a diversified account you know has always been a positive thing in the long run where you can at least catch some of that upside but be prepared to wait we've seen bitcoin bear markets even when it rips hard sometimes take two or three years of just pain right before you find that full send um, kind of breakout mode. And that needs a risk on environment in all equities. And the notion that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation and a safer asset than, you know, overall equities is BS and proven so. And so until you see equities, you know, really have a charge north uh, and the Fed accommodate that, that is just going to put too much downward pressure on the riskiest of all assets, which is not the OTC. It's still Bitcoin and crypto. All right. Charlie Bay, C holder. What would you like to say? Charlie, O-C, O-G, B-A-Y-C. What's going on? Hey, Chaz, how are you? Nice to see you again. Thank you. Uh, making an observation, as of late, Ethereum, I think due to the having or 2.0, it's been stronger than Bitcoin. And I joined late. I don't know if you mentioned Ethereum at all. Oh, but yeah. You... Oh, you already have. Okay. Uh, yeah. I apologize. Maybe. No, uh... never apologize. It's the same. Look, like, it's the same. And nothing's changed since, you know, my last spaces or even since we last spoke. You know, the relative strength of Ethereum over the last, like, you know, weeks and maybe month plus, I think holding up Bitcoin um, as it kind of consolidates in this channel. And then just the key levels to watch on Ethereum, you know, daily MA20. We've been talking about that for a long time. Exactly. So, uh, well, my thought is, is it possible people are selling, you know, uh, all, all coins, including Bitcoin, just trying to profit from this uh, upgrade cycle? Do you think of it would course. be? Of course. Yeah, people, but that happens all the time. There's always a balancing between uh, people taking profit, other people cutting losses. That's just ongoing. 
Um, and if you want to think about it more, if you're asking the question almost more philosophically, you kind of think about when um, that, you know, there's a room full of people. Everyone thinks it's a good party and people start drifting out. At one point, there's a critical mass where everyone realizes, hey, this party's breaking up. This thing sucks and they all leave. So, you know, kind of when is that point? But there's a gradual build up to that, if, if you don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, my question, actually, I want to get to it is that it looks like there's a, 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 a pattern forming for all the lower, lower high and then higher high. Is that possible? This is a buying point for Ethereum. That's actually my actual question. Da yep, absolutely. Daily MA50 is a, uh, is a, is a long thesis for, for Ethereum. Right, it's, it's held support there over the last week, so I think that's a reasonable spot for a long thesis. Of course, you want to manage your stop loss. Well, we talk about how the price has bounced off of it uh, four times in the last week, so that's very reasonable. Uh, Jason, Gringo Shaman, what's going on, man? Hey, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Pretty good. I just had a quick question about uh, MACD. I know the standard is the twelve and twenty six CMA, but yeah. for example, I know you like the eight and the thirty four. When you're yeah. just looking at candles, of uh, does changing the EMAs on a MACD invalidate it? No, it's just I mean, people look like people with RSI sometimes use a 14 look back period. Sometimes they'll use longer look back periods. Um, interested to see if either Fib or, or Chonus have thoughts in this. Um, I think you can. I mean, if if like only if the indicator only worked one perfect way, like I know Big Chonus likes to switch his Bollinger bands to three deviations, right? Yeah, there's no wrong answer on that question because there's edits you can make in your uh, oscillator settings to basically switch it up. Uh, I like to raise my <clears throat> RSI um, barriers to 80-20 instead of 70-30 and my stochastic to 90-10 instead of 80-20 and I adjusted my Ichimoku uh, settings as well. So <clears throat> there's no problem changing that uh as long as you're consistent in how you're reading the data um <clears throat> i'm not changing these to basically uh match my narrative i'm, I'm changing them uh because it, I, I feel it makes me a more conservative trader if i <clears throat> don't consider an extreme rsi uh above 70 but now above 80 i i'm you know, buying myself time in that extreme. And the same with the downside. If I'm not only, I'm going to use sub 20 uh, as an extreme instead of sub 30, then it's even more extreme in that capacity. So I do feel it's totally fine to adjust those as long as you're consistent with how you're reading them. And, you know, Ched's uses the EMA 8. I like to use the EMA um heck is it uh nine what is it nine and twelve i don't even remember right now i just drew a complete blank um but uh it 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 just about the sooner the ema the sooner the ma the more uh quicker you'll get the signal but there's a beta a, a larger chance that the signal will be a falser one so of course with time you offers you more confirmation but you tend to lose a lot of the meat of that trade the longer you wait and that's as a trader that's the risk versus reward but it's about consistency pick an oscillator pick a number and use that and learn to see how the price action likes to, to move with that you know these oscillators swim so and the uh, EMA swim with the price so get that sense of how the look happens and then you'll be able to say okay I feel this is an extremely oversold condition or overbought condition based on how I continuously see my oscillators indicators move and that tells me, okay, this is the time I should be a little more risk off or risk on based on that. All right. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. It's a great, a great topic. All right, buddy. Thank you for stepping up. Yep. Have a good one. Take care, man. We're going to keep the conversation flowing up steams. Steams for you. What would you like to see? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. What's going on? How are you, man? I watch your YouTube videos. You're amazing. Um, so basically, Thank you. I'm, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been trading for like, mm, since 2020, since like literally the day Bitcoin dropped to 3k, that's when I got in the market, you know, family gave me money, we invested it, made a crap ton of money. I gave my family back the money. I lost my own money because I discovered leverage trading, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. 
and uh, you know it's kind of like a pay your dues type of thing so lesson learned um so you know i just want your opinion on one thing really like for example right now i'm in a bitcoin short right and the way i like to trade is is um you know if i if i see a potential top forming i'll take a short right and i'll ride it all the way down to where i see a potential bottom forming so what i have trouble with is how do i properly scale out on the way back up from the short when i already entered the long you know what i mean so cuz i find myself really, taking, i find myself taking you know mm-hmm. giving profits back well everybody does and, and nobody really nails it other than maybe uh fibo or chonus here but um you have to scale in and scale out of your position, but you also should have multiple positions doing the same thing. So if you're going to do one position, break it up into four. That way you can stagger the stop losses at different levels. Some at break, at break even, um, some at profit, moving them down as key levels are flipped. So I think that would be my advice. Let me mute you real quick um, just because of the background noise. That would be my advice. Um, uh, you know, Rather than making it one big decision, if you have you know four or five different positions, each of those decisions is a little bit easier. So find ways to make it easier on yourself. You're not going to get the whole move. The key is to get a good part of the move. Um, and that's how I would answer that. Um, what about you? You guys have any thoughts on that one? Um, Chonish or Swanee? Yeah, the thought about, you know, taking money from relatives or friends and investing it in Bitcoin. Normally, that does not work. I, I know more negative stories about that than positive ones so if uh if you were successful and you made your friends and family money at a certain time of this market that's great but as a as a as just a note of of experience here um stay out of it don't take money from your friends or your family and have them think that you can invest it for them because you're responsible for their wins And you're responsible for their losses and being able to manage both of those, you know, you're doomed if you damn and you damn if you don't. So it might be tough to show up at Thanksgiving, you know, if you give the wrong advice, Uh, right? I'm sure there were some pretty nasty, uh, tense situations across the dinner table, uh, the past year or so. So yes. Did you want to say something more before we let you go? Oh, he's gone. Uh, Steams, did you want to say something more before we let you go? I I don't know what happened. I kind of missed exactly what you guys were saying. I the Twitter app just crashed on my phone. So I kind of missed everything. Listen, I, what I basically said was what I, instead of making it one big decision, take that your position size and break that up into five different entries and you can move right. them at different levels and you can stagger your stop losses, some in profit, some at break even like, you know, instead of one big decision, make it five medium or small decisions and, and you'll do much better. All right. All right. Got it. Yeah. So basically catch the meat of the move. That's instead all it of just is. Trying like, to go for the home run. That's it, brother. Get those, yeah, get those you can uh, singles. Catch three, four, and five and scale out at like seven, six, seven, eight. That's a good trade. Don't try and hit the one, two and sell it at the nine, ten, because you'll rarely be able to achieve it. And you probably held too long just to get that in the end. So it's just that middle part of the move, the meat, you know, that wave three, that where you want to be the best position to get the early part of it and to ride most of it on the way up. Luke, what would you like to say? It's your turn here. Luke Albrecht, what would you like to say today? Hey, Chase, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. How about you? I'm doing good, doing good. Um, you know, I'm, still, I'm still swinging short on Matic from, from a couple weeks ago, so it's all good. Um, I had a, a kind of more of a question on... Um, Yes, or uh, S&P 500 for people who might not trade yes. But uh, I know you're a big fan of the 200 futures. Day Yeah, up. futures. Yes is futures, basically. Mm-hmm. Yes. Was, oh, spy futures. Uh, so the 200-day moving average on ES1, uh, clear, I mean, from, to, from what I'm seeing, there's a clear deviation above it uh, and a, a test back into it. And obviously today, big, big rejection. It could be like um, a head and shoulders kind of even, huh? That's it. That was exactly what I was going to say. Yep. I was going to say, I see a head and shoulders here um, on the ES. So to sure. me, this is kind of more of like it's you can chart out about a lot of altcoins. Mm-hmm. You could say things look good, you know, or this looks potentially like it might be a good place to buy. But I don't know. I look at this and I say, I think everything, well, I, I, I trade crypto as a, uh, 
almost like a beater to the NASDAQ or the S and P. So you listen, know, you, you're yeah. right, but you also need to look for relative strengths. Like, like for, we were talking about Chili's earlier, CHZ, right? Like most of the <clears> market <throat> looks terrible, but like, if you knew nothing was going on, that's a chart you want to play all day. So okay. You've got to play just what's in front of you. You should be, you know, it's good to be aware, but at the end of the day, you know, your decision to make risk should base be based on, am I, am I trading with the trend? Is there an opportunity here? Do I have a well-defined plan that I know when it fails? And, um, you know, is it, does it look good? Is this really, is, does this look good or am I, am I reaching? And that's kind of what it's all about. Okay. Yeah. That was actually my, my question there is like, are you, are you factoring this in at all when you see it? Cause Chili's was actually the, the example. Chili's and TRB are the two examples. Play them. You should be longing in those until, until yeah. the trend breaks, ride the trend until it breaks. Cool. You know, and, and that's what allows you to, it's like also um, when there's these big price drops and the price drops into like major support, you know, it's often hard to buy when, when everyone's panicking. It's the same thing where you understand that you just have to look at each chart alone. And kind of let that, because that's what's defining your risk and your stop loss, you know, not something outside the chart. There is the yeah. notion, too, of the overcrowded trade where all the eyeball, like, like there's, there's only a few, right? There's only a few stock, a few uh, coins that have charts that look better than others. So all the eyeballs, or a lot of eyeballs are fixed on them. So it's not uncommon to then see, you know, an overcrowded trade where a chart looks to be on the verge of a major breakout move. Uh, only to basically just barely put in a higher high and then trap a bunch of longs. And crypto has a has a, a tendency to basically pull that off. So you can't understand, you can't discount the the uh, environment we're in, um, even though there's just a couple handful of charts that are actually uh, doing that. And as Chad said, you know, follow the money, follow the volume. Where's the money flowing? It's pretty obvious which coins are having the most dollar volume per day. And those are the ones with higher liquidity that you want to be involved in. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It, guys. Great topic, Luke. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, thanks, ma'am. We'll, we'll say goodbye. Thank you for stepping up. Next up, we have Ren Vegikoff. What would you like to say? Hi, uh, Chad. Uh, this is Ren from Singapore. I would like to show my appreciation for your contribution to all of us. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions. Number one, I would like to ask about trading bots, particularly um, DCA bots and grid bot. Do you ha could you share with me like um, any insight on this topic? No, I've actually never used bots, so I don't. I don't have any thoughts on that. If you have another question, you can. Definitely I think it's ask a book. Me. Is it a book or bot? Bot bots. Yeah, I don't use any of that stuff. I'm. I, I just me. I want to know what's going on. I stay in tuned with it. I'm sure there's some bet, some great programmers out there, who um to do that. But I think you have to combine sentiment with technical analysis to really understand what's going on and to be the most accurate. So maybe you know that's I don't use any bots. I've never used bots, so I don't have an answer for you in that. All right, cool. Uh, another question would be: I understand that like um the cri crypto is going downwards, um, but what would you say about the Ethereum and the altcoins? How would they behave leading up to the merge in September? We'll have to wait and see. They have charts individually. We'll have to watch. I mean, right now Ethereum. Either will hold the daily MA50 or it will not. Um, the, most, the rest of these altcoins have their own you know, key lines in the sand. So I think rather than even thinking like that, I think you want to uh, figure out what you're going to trade, study that chart, and just focus on the key momentum levels and just ignore these narratives and stories. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. I, I get your point. Thank Thanks you, so much. Thank you, brother. That's it. Um, let's see. Manny. What would you like to say? We'll wrap it up. There's just a few more. We're going to wrap this up. Manny, what's going on? Evening, Chase. How are you doing? Good. How are you? All good. All good. I think Fib basically asked some of my question. I wanted to find out your thoughts on the EVE merge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll so be interesting. I think it will lead to volatility. That will be exciting. Um, I think nobody really knows what, you know, what will be in terms of the um, success or challenges that it might, might face you know what the res nobody really knows what the resolution of those challenges will be so we'll just kind of watch and learn 
Um, in the meantime, you know, from my perspective, I can just hope it will bring volatility, volume, and more eyes to the space. I mean, um, and if it has more stability, that's good as well. Um, even though those two things are a little bit in conflict, stability uh, and volatility, um, you know, as anything like that it would be fine with me, especially volatility. Well, great. Uh, thanks, Jace. I appreciate it. I love your content. Learning a lot. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you stepping up, folks. Just a couple left here. Uh, Vashon Knox, what's going on? Uh, hey, can you hear me? Sure. What's going on? Good to talk to you again, Chads. I am a Bitcoin Live subscriber, longtime uh, listener and reader of your work. Um, Thank you. A couple quick things. Uh, one, for uh, Big Chonis, um, you mentioned earlier how you were looking at the, uh, the Fed's response to the monetary um, you know, liquidity of the USD liquidity issues um, with regard to a direction of the market. Um, you might be interested, there was an, uh, a, a blog that Arthur Hayes put out, uh, the most recent one. Uh, I think it was called uh, Teach Me Daddy. <laughs> he talks about uh, how he's tracking that, specifically um, looking at USD liquidity conditions um, and the different components that comprise that or drive that um, that are a little bit opaque um, if you're not actually looking at things like the size of the reverse repo or the, you know, treasury general account balance, et cetera. Um, so if you're looking at that, that blog was, 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 uh, was pretty informative. Um, sheds and, and I guess, um, yeah, so, so, uh, you know, Peter Brandt is pulled up, pulled a bunch, pulled a bunch out uh, based on the recent uh, decline. Um, Bob Lucas, obviously, is looking at his uh, four-year cycle um, and also sort of the sort of end of this current cycle. And everything from them is sort of looking uh, down for the price of Bitcoin at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I also follow uh, Cr um, Crown, um, Eric Crown, who yep. uh, uh, one of you guys is, is going to be on his show soon. Um, he's fabulous and and he's looking at uh some you know some volatility uh indicators that suggest that we're heading into a large move um um you know very soon mm -hmm. um so given this sort of the current break uh today uh of support um i'm just wondering you know if you know if, if we are headed into a large move and and uh you know some of these some of these folks brand lucas etc and and you know, are sort of suggesting the price is probably trending lower. Um, how do you, what support, what, what levels are you looking at right now? Like if I wanted to think about get, getting into a, a position, you know, short or long, what would be the levels um, that you would sort of set as stops uh, here? Does that make so sense? it's interesting. Yeah, totally. So it's interesting. You talked about Bob's um, cycle and Peter Brandt, you know, probably sold in the rising wedge break and some other um, concerns he may have had. But all of that, it, 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 it lines up with the price spending a lot of time below the weekly MA200, um, kind of for the first time. So that's just, you know, every minute, every really every week it, it can spend below it. It's just another piece of data that that, that long-term trend is damaged. Um, if you, and thank you for being a member. I really appreciate that. Um, hopefully you're enjoying it. And it sounds like you are. Definitely. Um, if you look back in March, I started talking about the price. This is when we were over 40K. I started talking. This is like late March. I, I, I kind of outlined a scenario where Bitcoin tested 20K, broke it, and then kind of dropped to that like 12 to 14K range. Yeah. And it's like got in a little closer to true every week. And there's been, you know, in the last few weeks, it's bounced a little bit. It's become less true, right? But we um, look to have finished the relief rally, you know, at about 25K. Looks like we kind of did complete it, you know. Most likely that was the top there of that move. Um, and so you do still still looking at 12 to 14 K. I think that's an area where I'm going to start dollar cost averaging. Um, I chose not to at the weekly 200, given kind of the momentum into it, given that we broke the prior all time high. Um, I just felt like we still probably had another leg down and um, maybe we don't get there though. Do we hold at 17 five and do a double bottom with a lower low? That's a possibility. I don't know if you've you watched my videos, you know, we're kind of that's a potential we're watching for, of course, um, for where I would feel really comfortable, though, just dropping like stink bids or low ball bids would be like 12, 13 K. Um, you know, even if we get there, we can see it bouncing up a little bit. I think that's a really solid level to buy 
uh, for the long term. So someone who's pretty conservative like me, that's where I'm looking. Um, you know, and, but like, do we have a, another a quick bounce out of this channel or does it go sideways for a year? I mean, I don't, you know, we, we'll have to wait and see, of course. Um, but uh, it's weakened in the long term. And I think it still makes sense to test that area, that 12 to 14K area. Um, is there a short yeah. here where, where we're at right now? Is there is what? There, is there a short in this area as we're as we're starting to break down? I mean, you got to bounce. If you want a short, you need to bounce, right? The short was at 25K. We had the double outside bars, right? Um, you can short the, the uh, daily EMA8. I mean, rejected there the last two days. But you need strength. Ideally, you want to you want a short strength, right? Not after it's breaking down. Fibboswani, what, what do you got for us? Um, no, I was going to say that um, it's me that I was I was supposed to record with Crown this morning. Yeah. Um, we, moved, we moved it to Tuesday. Um, something came up. He had to do something. But it's me that I'm that I'm getting on the show with him. Um, one of the reasons is uh, we we both come across with very different approaches. But my uh, my targets on what I do with the fibs is uh, coming in relatively close to what he's looking at, and from a timing perspective. And we're going to kind of go over that on Tuesday, but uh, so so tune into his show uh, to uh, to get all that information because it's it's going to be hard to say here on on this on this. But I'll tell you that um, for a while now, I can't remember when, but the the downside with a September low uh, possibility is still in play. Um, the area that I'm looking at is around sixteen seven. Um, as, as an area that I will be looking at as a spot for me to start getting long again. Uh, uh, but before that, um, I shorted today uh, at the top, uh, which was matching my shallow Fibonacci level, which I, um, with what I do in my modeling. But it also matches what Chad's was looking at, I think, on the 8 EMA. Um, and it kind of matched up. So I went ahead and shorted it this morning. Uh, and... I'm going to ride into my September low because I got to stick to my models and my plan. So uh, I've already moved down my stop, uh, my buy stop on that. So if it does rally on me, I can at least take some little bit of profit. I think we talked about that earlier. Trailing stops is key. Uh, so that's something to do there. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know that uh, Tuesday is when we're recording. So if you want to watch the show, we're both going to attack that September low possibility. Oh yeah. I, I, I watch, uh, I watch uh, crown every day. <laughs> Awesome. So, yeah, guys, no, I, hey, tell him to request me. I'd love to stream with that guy. So I don't know. I can't believe you have been on his show. I like that's unbelievable because yeah. that'd be a great conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, put a put a word in his ear. All right, I'll I'll, I'll talk to him, Chaz. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. Stuff. Stuff. Thanks for stepping <laughs> up, man. Um, yeah. Vashon, it's great to hear from you, man. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. All right. Let's see. We should got a couple more. Um, Acido. Acido ST. What's going on? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. What can we do for you, my friend? It's nice being here. Good. Yeah. Uh, please, I just have um, two questions. No, it's more, it's more like one question, but based on the... Um, from Bitcoin and then um, Solona. So I actually enter the market from uh, I enter Bitcoin from twenty four thousand and I short it. So, so from sorry I long. I'm longing, so I long it from twenty four and then the market go against me. Right now I'm already losing seventy nine to eighty dollar on that uh, particular trade or on Bitcoin precisely. So now. What's your advice for me? Would you advise me to like? Yeah. All right. So this is a great topic. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I just have a little trouble with the audio, but it's a great, um, it's a great question. So you have to think about this. First of all, you're never stuck in a trade, right? You're never stuck. You're just choosing to remain with a failed idea. So you want to think about if you've entered the reason, I think I put out a tweet uh, a few days ago. I said, if the reason that you decided to enter the trade no longer exists, then you now have a reason to exit the trade or a reason to exit the trade now does exist. Basically, uh, if your plan failed, get out. And if, if you're still not in, if you're still in it, like what are you doing? 
Um, so you've got to take control of your trading. You have to define your risk. You have to stick to your stop loss because right now you're in no man's land uh, with no plan. Um, and I think you really want to kind of avoid getting put into that situation. Um, Crypto L, what would you like to say? Crypto Ryuzaki. It's your turn to speak. We'll just have a couple more. We're going to finish it up. What's up, Hello. Crypto L? I just wanted to complain what's happening right now. It I was know, all right? going so good, and now we're going just yeah. down and down and down. How is that possible? Well, who, trend, who trend fucked this up? Continue. Uh, trends tend to continue. If you look at the weekly chart, we've we've only closed above the weekly EMA eight three times since the November top. Um, if you look at the, you know, that's a big thing to keep an eye on. If you look at the daily chart, we just had a really big warning sign around twenty five k, and we've been following through on that. So it's no, you know, no surprise. I mean, you should kind of expect it to go to eighteen nineteen k for like, like a week ago. You should have been, th- you know, expecting that for like the last week. You know, it's momentum. Momentum will continue. It's going to find out the next logical level. The price will seek out the next logical battleground, the most important battleground. The price will find a way to get there, right? So, so we got to wait for 90K. What? 19. We got to wait for Yeah, I think it's going to go lower and test support. There's support below 20K. You'll definitely have some buyers. And um, we'll kind of go from there. But it had loss of higher low structure at 22.5. That was a big deal. Um, it dipped below the lower Bollinger Band, and on the the relief rally, it wasn't even able strong enough to even tag twenty two five. So um, that was a warning sign. So you got to pay attention to momentum. You got to kind of pay attention to what the price is telling you. Um, Fibboswani, what would you like to say? Yeah, yeah, just looking at basics of like um, support and resistance. You're saying coming in at twenty five k as a resistance point, and it starts to break down. Um, it's I, I try to measure psychology. So the coolest thing is, is like if you're looking at a support level and you got and I look at it as trench warfare, there's a whole bunch of buyers that are sitting along that line, just like in war. And you got these sellers that are coming in, um, you know, trying to trying to take over that line. And if they do what normally would happen in a trench is they would jump out of the trench and go build another trench somewhere else to to uh, maintain their positions. And, and that goes along with what the trend is doing. If the trend is continuing to the downside, those buyers have, have to find a spot to really start to dig in that next trench. And that 19K or 19.5 or somewhere right around there might, might be that next level uh, to kind of look at. So, so if you look at it from, a, from that psychological aspect, a whole bunch of buyers in a trench, they just got taken over basically at the, at the ADMA that, that Chad's just talking about. Those sellers are owning that line right now, and there's not enough um, momentum, and there's not enough uh, you know internal strength of buying interest to bust through there yet. So the sellers have control, so they're going to jump out of the trench, push push you a little further until you get your feet kind of back down on the ground again. And that's where a lot of the buyers will kind of find that next area. And right now it looks to be about nineteen five. But if the but if the sellers come in with you know with a lot of strength as it comes into nineteen five, maybe it's seventeen five. You know that 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 previous low um, of where they would dig that trench. So that's the way you kinda, that's the way I kind of look at it is, and I'm really trying to measure who's going to win that fight when they, when we're around that level and use those indicators to figure out who's going to win that battle. And right now the sellers are winning the battle uh, here and should continue um, unless we start to see some buying interest come in and then starting to build a trench somewhere. But right now it doesn't look like anywhere is a good spot to really build that trench until about 19.5 at the moment. But that also came in, like Ches was saying, once we hit that 25K and started to work our way down, there was a lot of signals that said buyers might be jumping out of here and the mass of buying might come in at 19.5. And then you got the noise of going back and forth with different, you know, different levels of time frames. But when when you're looking at it from a from a trend perspective, that 19.5 made sense when that 25k held. So I just I just I just like to look at it as you know there's actually a war going on and try to figure out who's winning the fight. That's a great way to look at it, and I think you you said it and, and very eloquently and kind of focusing on the major levels and 25k held. You looked to kind of where there was demand. Um, so great, we're gonna finish up should finish up with our last guest. It's been a great space. Is Ankit. Good to see you again, Ankit. What's going on? Hey, Shahid. It's uh, really nice speaking to you. I've been following you in, uh, through a couple of months now. And uh, I just wanted to know next September, it's like a Fed meeting is there 21st and uh, 
15 September we have Ethereum upgrade, Ethereum merges there. So what do you think about the price? Will it uh, spike uh, during that time or uh, will it be on a downtrend uh, during the Ethereum merger? Do you think the Ethereum has the capacity to uh, pull up all the cryptocurrency market? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, listen, we're at a very interesting time still in the overall market. And I think it's arguably a wait and see situation because we're still range bound and trending between, let's just call it a shade under 20K and right at 25K. Hey, sorry about that. All right. So uh, I just had a quick emergency. So what was your question again? Yeah, Ankit here. Actually, I, uh, there's been a, there's Ethereum merger on 15th September next month. Yeah. And there's yeah. Fed, Fed uh, meeting also on 21st September. Probably they'll cut down. They'll uh, in, uh, increase the rate at uh, 50 BPS points. So what would you think? Like Ethereum might uh, pull up all the cryptocurrencies next month and the price might shoot up? Or What's, what's the point? Become... What's the point of even talking about it right now? What is it going to uh, do? Like, is it going to inform your, price. Your, um, your risk taking? Like, yeah, regard. Yeah, so, risk taking. I've been following why? it for a couple of months, actually. So listen, and... none of that's it. none of that's it. the speculation is what we're doing because we're bored. Let's mm-hmm. wait and see. Does the price can if, if Ethereum can get back up above the daily MA twenty, um, mm-hmm. maybe you'll, then you can look to get bullish again. So just kind of go level to level, focus mm-hmm. on what the price is telling you. The price is telling you that's a really important level. Um, mm-hmm. Fibble twenty. What would you like to say? Um, I always, when, when people start to bring up things like this, I, I tell them, um, if you want to be a technical analyst, um, one of the main tenets of technical analyst, uh, as uh, for technical analysis is that the market discounts everything. So I look to the indicators and in my models to let me know if any of that news matters or not. So even, I mean, just take it into consideration today. I mean, there was a Fed talk today. Um, I went ahead and, and, and sold my model, even though there, you know, there could be a lot of fundamental reasons or whatever. But even with the news that came out, we didn't break out of the range that we're already in. Uh, so to me, the news doesn't matter. It, like, well, you go back to the tenant of technical analysis that the market discounts everything. Um, and if the news mattered, it would have it would have broken uh, an EMA or a, supp- or a support and resistance you've been watching because markets will trade in a certain realm. And unless that news item is strong enough, um, to me, and it won't. If if it's something, it'll break out of the realm that we're trading. And right now, we're still in the same realm, regarding of what the news is. So, looking at something that's a month away or whatever, uh, to me, um, you you're going to start putting emotions and things into your head that'll make you do bad decisions, uh, because those are things that are so far down the line that so many dif- different things can happen beyond that, um, that I, that it's baby steps. And if you just kind of watch the markets and kind of stick to a plan uh, and not let that muddy up the waters too much. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't consider, you know, looking at fundamentals for other reasons, but if you, but from technical analysis, if you look at it and you're trading inside a vacuum and kind of ignoring the news, the indicators will let you know, let you know what news matters and which doesn't. That's right. I totally agree. You, you can tell when someone's a, a veteran trader when they start talking about the fact that the market knows everything. I mean, it certainly knows more than we do. And um, I often say, and that's a great answer, Fib, that these 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 questions of you know what might happen down the road because of this and that. That's fun when you're like you know having a glass of wine and smoking a cigar. And contemplating life, but like that's not something you trade off of. So focus on what the price is doing. Um, Chonus, do you want to wrap things up and say goodbye? I see some friends requesting to join, but I do need to wrap things up. So Chonus, what would you like to say? Yeah, you know, you, you mentioned a price area where you say you would buy at, and Vivo uh, mentioned uh, um, a price area lower than the current lows where he would consider uh, adding to a, a long position. Um, <clears throat> There's no way, and I've said this a lot on your spaces about we're not going to know when the low is in till probably a year or even more after it actually happens. So arguing about you know is the low in or not in, um, it's it kind of a like again I talk about arguing about who's going to win you know the twenty twenty four Super Bowl. There's still so much that has to happen before then. So focusing on just the overall chart. 
TA and knowing the FA in the background, I feel is still um, the best way to kind of approach what's happening in the market. Clearly, the events of today were FA driven, uh, hence basically Powell's speech. Um, and that was the big driver of the markets. And the markets kind of more or less quietness um, <clears throat> through this week kind of showed that everything was about what was happening uh, today. Um, Bitcoin gave us a signal, though, uh, kind of early on this week when it had that big dump where it basically, you know, said to us, OK, we're not going to see that fall through. And Bitcoin can be a very interesting uh, barometer to risk on, risk off. And we're basically seeing uh, in clear as day, the fall from 25K to basically 20K, it's a big move. Um, and we saw that uh, happen. And that just shows that the market is still very much risk off. And in the current stance of the Fed, and what they're trying to do to the economy to slow down inflation, I don't see anybody uh, other than dollar costers taking that chance and you know putting money into Bitcoin. You can't eat Bitcoin. You can use it to pay your phone bill, or at least you have to spend it to pay your phone bill. And so these are more important priorities than the masses <clears throat> putting money into Bitcoin and crypto, which they did for a time being which drove the bull market of 20 and 2021. So we're way past that. And we still have, as I said earlier, a lot of just dead money still in this market that needs to bleed out, unfortunately. So I'm hedged and I'm positioned for lower lows. I'm expecting these things, but that's the risk that we take for, for being patient and not entering now is that chance that we will get better entries down the road uh, versus assuming that the low is in now. And as I said before, that's not something that we should focus on because it doesn't really change the day-to-day -day and it's more or less irrelevant. Other than that, Cheds, I appreciate you inviting me on the show and uh, let's do this again sometime. Thank you, folks. That's at Big Chonus on Twitter. Um, he's uh, Chonus Trading on YouTube. I'm really happy to have him here. Also, my, my next guest who wants to... Um, speak is Fib Oswani. It's great to have him as well. Fib, you want to wrap up? What's going on? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Sean was saying. Um, I, when I said earlier that uh, I was looking at 16.7, um, I, I just want to clarify, I am not a bottom hunter uh, or a top hunter. Um, that is something that I think is absolutely futile um, in, in markets. Um, I mean, sometimes you can get lucky. Uh, but it's it's the that was the level that I would look at to first consider getting back long. It doesn't necessarily mean that that could be the, the low. Um, that's just more along the lines of what I'm looking for for a support level. So I agree with you, Tonis, that it's uh, um, something that we shouldn't focus on, uh, saying that the low is going to be this. Um, I think that that's an act of futility, at least from my experience over the years. But that's all I wanted to kind of say was I, I put that out there, not to say that I'm thinking that that's the low, um, I might get lucky and that might be the low, um, but it's uh, one of those things that I kind of like to tell people that I'm not trying to bottom hunt. Uh, I'm really just kind of looking for those next levels that make sense. So thanks, Cheds, for having me on. This is awesome. Uh, I, I, I like talking with you, uh, with you and the others, and I learn just as much as everyone else does. So it's awesome. Great to have you, man. Uh, definitely follow Fibble on Twitter. Twitter. I see a couple of folks who do want to speak. I do have to wrap it up, though. Um, I will promise I'll get to you next time or just hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I'm Big Cheds on Twitter. I'm the author of Trading Wisdom, 50 Lessons Every Trader Should Know. You can find that book on Amazon right now in four formats. You can also get it for free on my YouTube channel, Cheds Trading. I, of course, am a founding analyst at Bitcoin Live, the best-in-class educational platform for crypto. We have a world-class team. And for four years, I've been doing a twice-a-week full market update. And something I'm really proud of um, if you're serious about learning how to trade. So consider checking that out. Um, this is going to be uploaded to my YouTube. If you're listening to this on the replay, thank you. Um, if you're listening to this live, thank you. And if you didn't speak today or request to speak, 
think about it next time. I'd love to hear from you. It, are, it is your voices which make the, make the conversation more interesting. You can hear me say the same things over and over again, or you can hear me answer some great questions, and that's what, uh, what you do bring to the table. So thank you for that. So I will talk to you folks soon. Have a great weekend. Big Cheds out. Peace. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a replay of these spaces from um, August 26th. Um, I'll you know, I, I will probably do a new spaces here soon, but I just like to upload all of these to this, um, you know, for safekeeping on YouTube. So thank you for listening on the replay. Everybody, thank you um, who listened to it live and all that. Um, I'll talk to you folks soon and I hope everybody's doing well. Big Cheds out.